My name is Peter D. Temmerman, uh, CEO of LifeRamp B2B. Um, we just heard a really interesting presentation panel on using first, second, third party data in B2B. Um, and I heard account-based measurement come up. There were some really great questions around um, reach versus accuracy. Who are you talking to? And so when you're looking at large to enterprise level targeting, account-based marketing is a tool that works really well. You have a known list of accounts. Um, you have a specific set of people at those accounts you'd like to reach. Um, but there's this whole other side as well where you're talking to SMBs, small to mid-sized companies where um, the CEO and the uh, senior dishwasher person might be the same person, right? Uh, and it's, it's pretty common, actually, because when you look at the number of large companies in the U.S., there are roughly 25 to 30 million companies in the U.S. Only 6 million of those have more than five employees. So the bulk of the companies that we're working with are, in fact, um, small to mid-sized businesses. And so we thought it would be interesting for us to have a discussion around what does that mean if, if we're looking to be effective in reaching out to not only the large companies that are out there, but also the smaller enterprises, um, what would that look like? This problem gets a little bit more challenging when you start to ask the question of what is an SMB, right? Um, I could do a poll, but since we don't have a lot of time, um, when we talk to companies like Microsoft and we ask them what is an SMB for you, it's companies with 1,000 employees or less. Sometimes it's 500 employees or less. Um, Intuit might say, Give me companies that are 20 employees or less. And so it really depends on who you're talking to, which countries you're talking about, what types of products you're selling. And so, so these are all considerations that we're going to be discussing today. Um, I'm joined by Bob and Mark. I'll, I'll let you guys introduce yourselves really quickly. Great. Bob Ray, I'm um, the CEO of DWA. DWA is a uh, B2B specialist agency that focuses on media activation and audience planning. Uh, we start really with the core of, of looking at it from a digital perspective, but we do offline and online media. We were recently acquired by Merkle, which is a Ditsu Aegis agency, uh, and currently going through the process of really building a global world-class B2B media agency um, that we feel like is very unique in the marketplace. Uh, I'm Mark Dye, Chief Strategy Officer for Bombora. Bombora is uh, one of the leading B2B data companies. We work very closely with LiveRamp and, and Bob. And we have two sets of data. We have classic firmographic demographic data. But then we also track over 3 million businesses and their content consumption to actually create intent data around um, their, their purchase uh, research going on over the next you know, time horizon, three to six months to 18 months. Awesome. Thank you both for being here. I appreciate the time. Great. Um, so I think. In my opening, I sort of did a great job of making this whole talk track really ambiguous. What are, what are we even talking about? <laughs> um, so I thought it would be a good start to have Bob maybe introduce us with an example of a, a marketer who's looking to reach SMBs and what that looks like, and we can talk through, through a few examples. Great. So I have to look out in the audience and make sure that if there's someone from this example out there that I've got it accurate. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Sprint Business. Uh, because I don't see anyone out there uh, representing Sprint right now. Um, it's a very unique situation. I think it's indicative to um, you know, the marketplace and what companies, especially in the telco space, focusing on consumers versus B2B. And the S&B marketplace kind of is, is one of these ambiguous, they don't know exactly how to reach, so they use consumer-esque type of strategies. Uh, versus enterprise using you know ABM and other other strategies pretty successfully. So Sprint, uh, if people can remember history, uh, acquired Nextel a long time ago, like 15 years ago. And about that point, uh, Nextel was probably the preeminent uh, mobile company in the world, especially in the U.S. And um, Sprint ignored it and basically let it go to the wayside. And about three years ago, um, they started investing back into uh, Sprint Business as a brand. And so they, they brought DWA in to help them think about how to target, who the best targets were, 
um, thinking about how to reach them through both TV and looking at intent. And so over the course of that period of time, we really looked at kind of a two-pronged strategy, which is really looking at not just buying GRP TV, uh, our TV by GRP, like the consumer agency was, but look at it from a digital first aspect and then look at the best way to actually do linear buying to increase the awareness at the same time being able to measure the increased intent. And so over the course of the last two to three years, it's been Sprint's most successful business unit, uh, SMB is, as far as trying to orient uh, really a digital first strategy. So I think thinking about it from who your target is, what the current intent is in the marketplace or around those, don't treat SMB as the same. Think about it from a size, industry, needs basis, and that will really help, I think, um, get to a point where it's not just about reach, it's about quality reach and being able to increase the, the real intent in the marketplace. Yep, and so, so Sprint's success was really driven by their digital first strategy. Was there, were there any particular um, challenges that you saw that Sprint had to overcome to be able to do that effectively? Yeah, I mean, I think that Everybody in the B2B space with SMB, I think, struggles with um, just SMB being seen kind of as generic and, um, you know, not wanting to limit, you know, based upon trying to target in a more precise way. And so, um, and then the long tail of just trying to really understand intent from unknown audiences to known audiences, I think they struggled with because their data set was so old and uh, the ability to really activate that was, was limited. So having you know, a clear roadmap helped them get their head around what the expectation should be you know, on a quarter to quarter basis, yeah. which then was a way for them to talk to the board about what they're investing in from a business perspective. Yep, makes sense. Great. Mark, any examples that come to mind for you? I'll use Sprint. Great. <laughs> because we work with Bob very closely on this. And when you look at, at Sprint, it's really about segmenting the audience down and defining what SMB really is and verticalizing it. We did a ton of work with, with Bob and his team specifically on Sprint to start to identify those markets and where, you know, and applying Bumbor intent data to it and, and getting finer and finer. And we, we've been working on this now for a couple of years and it's, you know, it's, it's gone well. Um, years of working with American Express, again, same, same kind of challenge. The challenge in, in SMB versus enterprise. As enterprise, you know who your customers are. Um, you may have to find the buying committee. You may have to, you know, um, people move around, but you know pretty much, you know, who your clients are in SMB. It's really about efficiency and scale and cutting the pie in a very different way. Right. And I'll use, you know, we talked about this. Um, I'll use Intuit as an example. I, I go way back. So in the early 90s, um, Eric Dunn, who's a friend of mine who was a co-founder of Intuit, what they discovered was small business owners did their work late at night watching late night TV. And cable TV was just launching. And so they could buy an ad on late night cable TV for 200 bucks and reach 5 million business owners. And they actually accredited finding that channel at that moment in time, the efficiency versus the reach, to actually driving their brand. And so that's what we're in, even in today's world. What we're trying to do is find, find efficient ways to get in front of these people because you can't afford to hire an expensive salesperson to call on every SMB out there. You gotta find much more efficient ways to go about it. Yep, that's great. Um, and uh, one last example, I wanna drill into that a little bit more, but um, one last example that might be interesting is sometimes um, SMB uh, campaigns or SMB opportunities um, come from consumer companies as well, or at least consumer companies that we would think about um, more traditionally. So a good example is, for example, Starbucks, who um, was looking to sell gift cards in bulk, personalized to a specific business, and they thought, you know, we wanna sell these gift cards in mass to companies whose entire business depends on referral business. So we need to go out there, we need to find um, real estate agents, we need to find dentist offices, those types of companies, but they don't necessarily know exactly who it is that they're looking to target, at least not by name. And so this gets back to 
one of the differences between SMB targeting and the larger enterprise targeting is that you're dealing with a an unnamed list of accounts, essentially. Um, and it's more about defining the SMBs that you're interested in based on their features than it is based on their name. Um, and the goal, of course, is to get them to come to a site and typically do things in an efficient way, as Mark was saying, where you're not involving a sales team, which is costly, you're just trying to get them to buy something through, for example, an e-commerce site. Swipe your credit card, you can buy 500 gift cards, they're all personalized, and off you go. And so it's more about a, you know, getting a large number of these opportunities created than it is to have a small number of opportunities that create a huge amount of value. Um, so with that, I'd love to drill in a little bit more in the differences that we see between enterprise level sales versus SMB sales. Um, and Bob, you, you talked a little bit about how a lot of enterprises, B2B marketers, are now using essentially three classifications right. when they think about um, who they're talking to and how they're selling to them. Can you talk about that a little bit and how prevalent that really is? Well, there is, I mean, there's consistency and there's inconsistency. So most companies define the a three tier type of process where you have enterprise accounts and you have commercial accounts that are somewhere in the middle of SMB accounts. Right. Um, and it, that can range from companies that only sell to the enterprise that actually have three tiers of enterprise accounts to those companies that are only focused on kind of the commercial and SMB down and how they think about different sizes within each one of those. I think that that's one way to look at it. I think that uh, the characteristics of what you're selling and, and how they buy is just as important uh, when you're thinking about that model. And then a third aspect of it is what is the influence wheel? And so I don't really hear a lot of that thinking, but it's, it's critical, not just in the enterprise where you are doing ABM and you don't really know who the influence wheel is, but in commercial and SMB, it can be just as important from a reference perspective or from just someone's ability to understand what your solution actually delivers on. And just to think about how do you you collectively do that and who you're communicating to is, is kind of the critical secret sauce of what our clients are looking for, not just, you know, there is no monopoly on decision making in any of those. Right. So it's not just about the decision maker. Yep. And so, so the inside some of these enterprises you see um, enterprise level um, classifications of businesses or opportunities, corporate and then SMB. Um, and Presumably, that's how the sales teams organize themselves around those concepts. How does that then factor into what the marketing team is being tasked with, and how do they think about budgets and, and, and objectives against each of those? I mean, I think, it's, I think it's an interesting point. I've been at this a long time, and my uh, reflection is the business and the sales coverage normally orients around that more than marketing coming forward and saying, these are how we, this is how we should approach the marketplace based upon these different insights. It's kind of like the two meet in the middle and sometimes it doesn't necessarily, you know, coalesce into the, to, to the right strategy and the right investment model. So, um, you know, to the marketers that we deal with, it's very important from a business planning that they take the advice package out to the marketplace on how to think about the sizes and the, the types of, uh, prospects that they're going to prioritize. I think it's it mainly comes down to a prioritization uh, initiative because I, I really do believe that you know most companies try to do too many things and yep. they don't prioritize enough. So do you feel like uh, most of the priority then goes to the enterprise and the corporate accounts versus SMB or depends. it really depends? It de just depends. Okay. I mean I, I think that I mean it's a lot of cases it's intent and opportunistic. Like I look at Amazon business is like they're trying to reinvent the way that businesses buy products online. Yep. And uh, the way that they've gotten into that business is definitely SMB and going kind of the easy yep. route to changing over, you know, to the Amazon business site versus the Amazon site. But the bigger opportunity for them is to reinvent how people buy IT, how people buy their manufacturing goods, et cetera. And so they're going to very much focus on the enterprise. Yep, makes sense. 
And Mark, how have you observed the difference between enterprise targeting and data usage versus SMB within the company? You know, this is a model thing. It's, it's really about like what are the goals of those various groups, right? And so in an enterprise, 18 month sales cycle, you know, as my friend Dale Durr likes to say, the size of the prize, right? You can deck a lot of resource against that. SMB is all about efficiency and reach and verticalization. And what we're, like, what we're all working together on is taking SMB and actually starting to verticalize that into you know, the gift card buyers because, yeah. they, because they, have, they have a different set of needs than um, you know, the software companies. And you know, it's a lot of I you know, talk about, it's like if you look at Sprint, they have brick and mortar. So you're, you know, you're, dry, you're trying to drive people to a store yep. versus software, you're trying to drive person to an engagement. Yep. And so SMB just becomes not one thing, it becomes many things and you have to kind of build programs around what your product does right. and how people buy it. Yep, yep, makes sense. And so you were talking a little bit about the challenges that some of the SM, that some of these marketers see in targeting SMBs. Um, what what would you say are the the top two or three biggest challenges that any marketer has when they're trying to get you know um, some results when targeting SMB accounts? You know, I think a lot of mistakes people make is they don't define the market before they start. Yep. And so then there's a lot of waste, right? So if you do a good job defining the market up front. Then it's about scale and accuracy, right? right? And 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 um, and then doing overlays of data upon that because if you're if you're targeting a company the size of Bombora that has 120 employees, that's considered very small, and so you, you still have some of the same problems you have in the enterprise. Is you got to find the right people in that company, yep. but they're still SMB, so you have to target the company and then and then the right the right sliver. If you're going after people with 10 employees or less, then it's more just to get everyone. Right. Because you really, because everyone's an influencer in that setting, yep. right? So, so it's really about defining the audience, the scale, and then the accuracy. How do you measure it out the back end? Right. Um, and, and that's where you know a lot of the work that we're doing with you guys and DWA is, is now okay. How do you actually do attribution against an SMB that's kind of in, lives in a world between consumer and enterprise, right? It's right. Kind of in the middle. So we're working on ways to solve that. Right. So uh, let's maybe switch gears to that a little bit. So. When you think about SMB specific solutions, because I know we're going to do questions at the end again as well, and, and you probably were going to ask the same question, so I'll ask it for you. Uh, so when you think about this, this question of, okay, I've, I need scale, but I want accuracy. Um, and I would, I would even say in, in SMB targeting to date, there haven't been a lot of options out there because everything has been really focused on ABM, ABM, ABM. Everybody's has been talking about it and is still talking about it. It's one of the big adoptions that we expect to see in this, this year. But I, I feel like more and more people are starting to think about, well, wait a minute, what about that long tail? Um, and so can you talk a little bit about the solutions that are out there specific to SMB targeting and, and in the context of you know, reach, reach versus accuracy as well? Yes, so, so traditionally, SMB has been done by onboarding offline data where LiveRamp started, right? Bringing yep. email addresses in, getting a net prospects or a merit direct database and, and trying to onboard that. Yep. And so that's one methodology, but, that, but there's a lot of problems with that, with stale data, with, with, with you, know, e you know, email addresses, not match rates of 10%, 8%, right? Match rate problems, yep. all of that. The, you can also then go down the IP to company route but if you know how IP works, it's really good for large companies, but not really good for smaller companies. That's right. Um, because everything's masked behind the Verizon and the Comcast mm -hmm. ISPs. And so the, um, the way we're approaching this in partnership with, with you guys is we're doing behavioral targeting against IP addresses with overlaid cookies. And what that means is we see a billion B2B events a day, over 35 billion a month. And we look at the IP address and what that looks like, right? What a business IP address looks like compared to a Starbucks, a hotel, a home. And they have very, very different attributes. Um, you start to see, you know, a bunch of computers log on at 8 a.m. And they're persistently on that IP address at 5 p.m. Then they go away and they don't come back on on the weekends and they go to certain sites. And so you can use data science to actually use behavioral um, 
uh, methods to actually identify small business very accurately, yep. right? And so our, our, our true set, we're now at about 87% accuracy uh, accurate against our true set. Yep. And then we overlay cookies on top of that. And now you start to get to a place where you, you, can, you can actually identify a small business uh, with, versus a home versus a Starbucks. Yep. Yeah, and so that's building on the, the more traditional firmographic targeting where you're essentially using uh, static IP addresses assigned right. to businesses and, and targeting everybody that sits behind there. So very, very dynamic. Though. Now you're using uh, data science to do that. And are you finding that that also gives you the, the scale that, that we're looking for when we're building these campaigns? Yeah, um, so, so go back to, so we work very closely with you know, Manta and who is a, a small business directory and, and, and as Peter said earlier, they've identified about, about six to eight million businesses that have five employees or more. Yep. Mm -hmm. And based on behavioral targeting, we've identified about six million businesses that look like a business. And so yep. the numbers are, you know, are making sense, right? Because right. a lot of these numbers just don't make any sense people talk about. Yep. So we're doing kind of you know, sampling and, and, the, and the, the math is working. So you have six million businesses with uh, five employees or more, right? Right. How, right? how well does this solution work when you get into that true long tail where you're dealing with companies that have one to four employees? Yeah, that goes back to what, you know, so at that, you're, base, you're back to the device level. Right. Right, so at, at, right. At, at that point, you're no longer aggregating a business, you're looking at a device. Yep. And now it's content consumption patterns on a specific device. Yep. yep. Right, and that's so right. That, that's where the natural break occurs because you just don't have the scale at right. that, so now you have to go to the device level. That's right, and so this is a solution that could work globally. Um, it's, it sounds like that would just uh, work out of the box, or, or does that need? Yeah, so, 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 so it does work globally, but it's a little more complex because now you have GDPR, like right. in Europe, for example. Yep. So now what we're doing in the UK um, is we're identifying the IPs that look like businesses, yep. right? exact same process, but then we have to overlay, do, okay, now does this cookie associated with that IP address have consent, right? right? So right. It, it just makes it more, it makes it more complex. It still works, but now you have to start to stitch things together. And with California coming online yep. in January, it's gonna come here too. So the work that we're doing, you know, in EMEA yep. right, is gonna be here, you know, sooner. I mean, I, I've been already involved in probably 10 conversations in the last 30 days about what are you guys doing for California, you know, Every, it's like last year, you, you lived through this you know, with me, it's like GDPR you know, started in January and we worked to launch in May. Yep. The same thing is starting now here. But That's it's, right. again, to answer your question, it's the same methodology, but it's a little more complex because you have to add another layer. That's right, yeah. Yeah, and I think to your point, we should expect these privacy laws across the entire US before long, right? Yeah. Right. Um, that's just a matter of time, not, not if at this point. Correct, yeah. Um, so, Bob, I, I wanna come back to this concept of um, global scale. Um, I know we worked on a project together in Australia. Um, so there's a new law going into effect in Australia uh, in the next few months where every single business needs to have a cloud-based accounting solution. Um, so using uh, Excel spreadsheets, the backs of uh, napkins that have already been used is no longer going to suffice. And so the Australian government demanded that every business in, this, in the country needs to have a cloud-based accounting solution. And so uh, we started working with Intuit on a campaign. Uh, there are essentially three main companies in Australia focused on accounting software. Uh, one of them is, is a homegrown Australian business. The other one, I think, is out of New Zealand. And then there's, there's Intuit, which, as Mark mentioned earlier, started by doing late-night television advertising here in the US. Um, and so they ended up building a definition of their core uh, audience that they wanted to target, which were companies between one to 19 employees. Um, and we see this a lot where there are lots of companies that we know well here in the US who are doing things globally. And so I was curious, how, how often does that come up? That you have a, a, an account who's saying, hey, Bob, I, I wanna do this, but I'm, I want to do it in multiple countries, or I want to do it globally. What's like? Where does that land in in the relevance of how important that is? Yeah, I mean, I think that you're bringing up a specific case where Intuit is is facing a lot of headwind with you know historical plus zero, who's kind of the new brand in that marketplace that um, is only cloud based or was yep. created as a cloud based solution. 
So in that, that particular case, you know, it's all about Australia. It's all about, you know, the marketing problem that, that Intuit faced and how to precisely target the right audience to, to change the perception that they had at, you know, somewhat of a, you know, an efficient way, but a more impactful way. So, you know, TV and, and offline was very important in that aspect. It wasn't just about, you know, creating a digital uh, relationship with, with, um, with their target. So in, in that context, if I look at kind of the biggest brands that, that we work with, um, it's, it's a complex situation. We, we feel like we have to have experts, not just here in the US, but experts sitting in specific markets that understand the dynamics of not just the digital and data space, but also how brands are built or you know, brands are, are changed from a perception perspective. Right. So, um, you know, the, the, the data side of things definitely is um, a long tail issue yeah. as yeah. we can look at it from a English perspective or we can look at some markets that, that do have solutions like Japan where we can bring, you know, specific ideas to, to our clients. But outside of that, it's, uh, it's, it gets challenging. It gets challenging. Yeah, that's right. And it's interesting because a lot of the technology companies uh, seem to have a pretty strong focus on the APAC region as a whole, uh, not just the English-speaking countries and uh, Japan. And so, so you're identifying that as a key challenge is to be able to access data in those markets. It's, it's interesting, but you know, we work in tech space quite a bit. Um, it's, it's a focus, but from an investment profile, it's usually less than 15% of people's budgets when they're going into that market and you're looking at you know, multiple markets, mm -hmm. not just the singular market. And even if you're looking at three or four markets and you only have a certain amount of investment, there's really only a certain amount of digital type of advertising that you can do. So I, I do think it's you know, the planning aspect of and prioritization is, is kind of the most important part of putting the right plan in place yep. uh, for, from an advertising perspective. Got it. Now, so I'm going to assume for a second that, let's say Mark is able to deliver on not just SMB, but just data in general across that whole region. What, what would the steps be to get, uh, to get that to become a core part of a client's uh, budget or focus? Do you see challenges there beyond just making the data available? Um, I think that the expertise sits in the US and Europe mainly to activate campaigns like that. Yeah. You know, you get into markets like Singapore and China and so forth, there's limitations on just the professional service aspects of activating campaigns. Yep. I think that will evolve quickly. Um, I, you know, I think that, not to predict, I, I think that it will, if there were a capability that allowed it and there were use cases that uh, worked, you yep. would see a big wave of people oh, yeah. taking advantage of it because it is such a gap right now across Got Asia. It. Okay, I assume you're listening, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, you and I talk about way too, too much. So, um, so, so w what is it, w when you think about Bombora, what are you guys doing to bring that data to, for example, the APAC markets uh, and, and to do that at scale? Well, we're working with LiveRam, free, <laughs> sure. free plug. Um, but no, what we're, so in reality, and I'd love your thoughts on this too. In reality, you've got Europe, which is wrestling with GDPR, and, yep. so we're, and we're slowly solving that. But they understand the value of data. They're willing to buy it. Um, the US is, is a very mature market. APAC is, you got tons of interest. People love to talk about it. No one wants to pay for it, right? They don't really understand they haven't gotten their heads around, oh, I have to actually pay for this data. Right. So, so I think the challenge for, for all of us in APAC is to turn that enthusiasm into revenue, yep. right? Because you know, we can get meetings all day long in Australia and Singapore and Japan, yep. but then when it comes time to write the check, and like I'd love your thoughts on this, they hesitate a bit and they're like, oh, I have to, it's really cool, but I gotta pay for it. Right. And I think that's the challenge that we're seeing is when does the market mature enough to where the revenue warrants Mm -hmm. Right, all the investment, and I think that that's where we are in that middle ground. Yep. Do you okay, agree so with you that? Think, yes. I do. I mean, I think Japan will move 
quickly. I think the other markets, other than uh, Australia, yep. are going to be trailers in that yep. for different reasons. But price sensitivity being one of those, you think? Yeah, I just just availability of you know the market conditions and sizes. I mean, depending upon who the business is, the interest in you know Indonesia may be very very limited. Uh, right. So it won't be where they'll focus. Where India may be a big focus, but the 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 case of you know how people consume content in India is quite different. Uh, it's you know it's a mobile market, mm -hmm. but it's also a complicated TV market too. So it's yeah, you know, I think that it's just a different. It's just different by by market, and that's you know when we go in and we advise people where to focus, we do think of those characteristics of where they can actually have an investment and actually see an impact. But, 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 but I think you know, that's where these partnerships are so critical because I think when you're looking at Cisco or HP or any of these global companies, right? they understand that as well. Yep. And so they want to work with someone who, right. who, who has a foot in all those and is working with them to figure those out because they understand the same challenges. Right. Right? So it, they don't want to silo this off and work with this company in Europe, this company in the US, this company in APAC. They want a global solution. So as these things mature at different paces, right, they're applying the same programs and the same methodology, yep. no, no matter the stage. There's no doubt. I mean, if you look at that size of company and the sophistication of, you know, the data that they're sitting on, the intent that they see, um, you know, the ability to, to, in the future, I think, to leverage their reseller data. Um, and be able to, to bring that back to target specifically into these different markets, they should have an advantage uh, just based on their own knowledge base. So. Right. Great. Yeah, thank you for those insights. Um, so if I, if I sort of look ahead, um, and I think B2B in general is still fairly new to this, um, but in the consumer space, we saw the adoption of third-party data and the combination of first and third-party data then we saw companies want to understand what, what's the impact of me using all of these tools and what's the impact of me actually paying a certain amount for data. Um, what are your guys' thoughts on how measurement plays into SMB targeting? What, what's available? What things can be done? And what would you measure? And if you, Bob, if you have any examples, I'd love to hear them, of course. Um, that's a loaded question. I think that... Um, I don't think very many people are doing that well right now. Right. I think that in the B2B space, the lifetime value of your advertising spend and your customer base is the right way to think about it, but no one has patience to really have that as the Wait model. For that, yeah. So then you, then you start thinking about accessing new audiences or new prospects, and so you use proxy metrics from a digital perspective that are measurable. But the quality of that is implicit to the, the downstream impact to the business, yep. meaning that an impression isn't an impression. Like some impressions have more quality than others. And a return visitor isn't a return visitor. Some return visitors have much higher impact than other return visitors, et cetera, et cetera. And so, um, the modeling of that and then the ability to show progress in each one of those proxy areas mm -hmm. from a causation standpoint is what clients are looking for, from yep. agencies, from partners, to be able to, to map that out in a, in a holistic, realistic way. Because that's what the board's looking for. The board doesn't care how much reach their advertising has, unless right. it's Sprint. Sprint does. Uh, but as in general, they, they care about pipeline and sales and yep. volume versus velocity, something that we talk about. You know, you have higher volume of, of, uh, of your, your pipeline and it goes through at a higher velocity, then that's a really great way to look at whether you have a you know, good marketing model or not. So how do you attach to that in time? I, first party data is obviously core because yep. you know who you're, you know, even though we're talking about B2B, the identity of the person that you're talking to is clearly what you would like to, yep. to, to know because you know all sorts of behavioral characteristics of that. And do you see, it, just a follow-up question, do you see a difference in um, how 
brands, B2B brands approach SMB, I won't say measurement, but KPIs versus um, some of the enterprise uh, clients that they're going after? Because I, I would have to assume the sales cycles are dramatically different. And so you can get a little bit more of that instant gratification, it seems like, on the SMB side. I mean, it depends on the product. Okay. Honestly, like, and I think that that's, uh, you know, we, we talk that way because shorter sales cycles because it's less money usually to buy an SMB product, but for, you know, a small business, that is all, you know, qualitative to, you know, how much they have to spend on whatever the product is. Yep. And so it could take them six months to a year to, to buy a product. Yep. So knowing the buying behavior and where they are in the sales cycle is still really important when it comes to SMB. Yep. And it does for a consumer also if it consider, you know, if it's a considered product. So um, again, I think that, that really understanding kind of the context of what's being sold and you know, who's involved with the influence and how important the brand is to the consumption, how commoditized it is, where pricing plays in, how important trials are, like yep. all of those things are kind of within the, the overall equation. Makes sense, yep, thank you. But to, to, to jump on that for just a second, right, because I think, we talked about this at breakfast, um, I think the challenge is if you've got a DMP, a CMR, a marketing automation system, right? Go on and on, a contact-based system, and you've got data. Mm -hmm. If you expect a B2B marketer to stitch this stuff together on their own, you've got very unrealistic expectations, right? Yep. And so what we're doing is that, you know, we now, you know, we'll push intent data into Salesforce, which will connect to the contacts in Salesforce, which will go to the SDR who makes the call. Yep. And now that sales rep has a one-to-one -one correlation. Did that prediction turn into an opportunity? Yep. Right, and so now we're, we're in Adobe, GA, Tableau, right? So we're doing the, the stitching together for our partners and for our customers, and, and as we talked about, you've gotta bring, you can't bring data and just say, here it is, figure out what to do with it, right? That's right. You've gotta bring solutions that actually solve a real problem yep. and say, your problem is attribution, let me show you how to tie this to your open opportunities in Salesforce so you can actually measure this. Yep. And so that's where we're really headed is, giving people the tools and the integrations to actually measure this stuff and show them how to measure it so you get out of this black box, trust exactly. me, the data's good. Yeah, that's right. That's, I mean, we talked about it before. Like, that's part of what's missing, is that it's too generic. Like, there's a promise of certain outputs, yep. but there's not enough kind of prepackaged solutions. How would you go about acquiring this type of SMB and what type of strategies would you deploy if you know that your brand is not well known, that the product is, you know, you know, not part of a prioritized product set, et cetera, and you could plug those, you know, questions in with answers, you could have a solution that then you could build upon is something that I think clients would really resonate to. Yep, yep. that's right. I think um you know, you can read, read analyst report after analyst report. I think the two themes that keep popping to the top is one, as a B2B marketer, my data tends to be very siloed. And it's hard to sort of pull it together in a way that I can just hit the easy button and turn it on. Right. Yep. And two, um, if you're looking at vendor solutions, I feel like the messaging is frequently, I'm being sold products and I'm looking for solutions. And so sort of the intersection of those two things is probably, uh, something that's really important to think about. Yep. Um, okay, I know we have a, just a few minutes left and I wanna make sure we leave time for uh, a few questions. Um, does anybody have any questions that they'd like to throw out for our, our panelists here? We have one, yeah, go ahead. Spencer's coming. <laughs> Hi, I was Hi. just wondering how your SMB and mid-market leverage second-party data, since they don't usually have a lot of data customer volume in order to expand their reach, maybe cheaper than third-party data, and if they use the same providers as their OEM partners to leverage these data. So, so the question is um, how you could use third-party data? Se second-party second data, you know, okay, second target B2B, and uh, wondering if these second-party data partners will be the same as the technology OEM partners that the brands are working with. Got it. And so the question is, how do you use that to expand your own first-party audiences? Correct. Got it. Okay, well, um, 
Mark, I'll start. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to take a pass. I mean, the first thing is how do you define second party data, right? So second party data is traditionally defined as this site shares with that site, right? And, and so you, you know this person. Um, I'll speak about Bombora specifically. We have our tags on over 5,000 B2B websites. So it essentially is second party data because it's coming from a known trusted source. And then, um, so we run a co-op against that. And so the, the vast majority of our data is coming from tags on sites and, and our partners allow us to share that data. So if you're in, you know, if you're in a small business section of an SMB and we're ta tagging that as content consumption, now that person goes to Amex, right? We can flag that person was just consuming content over here on SMB finance and now they're on your site and that's how we start to leverage the first party and the, and the, the third party and we, we can put tags up on the client site and we will share with them everything we know about that, that, that person, that, that device rather, the content that you've been consuming. So that's how we're doing it in our world is because we have tags on sites, we basically operate in second party data. Does that yeah. make sense? Okay. Um, do we have time for one more question? We are actually over time. Got it. Okay. We were going by, by We were done anyway. I realized that started not at the start of the session, but <laughs> on stage. All right, well in that case, I'd like to thank uh, both Mark and Bob. I really appreciate the time and your insights. And uh, thanks everybody for uh, joining us. Okay.